So summing up, what we have learned from just this, these small sampling of behavioral experiments, what we've learned about face recognition is that it seems to work differently from object recognition in the disproportionate inversion effect, in the holisticness of face perception, both the part whole effect and the uh, inversion effect. Um, and we've learned that one of the ways that it seems to be different from recognition of objects and other things is this kind of mandatory processing of the whole. We see that with the part whole effect and the composite effect. Okay? We also see that it's not perfectly invariant uh, to image variation, at least for unfamiliar faces. Okay? Um, and that suggests something about the representations we extract from faces. They're not that abstract. They're a little bit more literal than you might have thought. So notice all of that without looking inside. We haven't even gotten to the brain yet. All we've done is test the output of the system and ask people simple low tech questions. That's pretty awesome. Okay, That's the field of cognitive psychology. That's the field I was trained in. I have a little bit of a bias that cognitive psychology is the coolest thing. I actually think to be a cognitive psychologist, you have to be so much smarter, right? You can't just cheat and look, you know? You have, to, you have to actually come up with some kind of clever way to measure just the output and from the output infer how the inter interior workings actually work, okay? Nonetheless, now that we can look inside, let's do that, okay? Okay, oh, but first let's review strengths and weaknesses of behavioral methods. As I just showed you, it's pretty good. They're pretty good for characterizing internal representations, at least qualitatively. So Jim DiCarlo, the chair of this department, uh, is a monkey neurophysiologist and a computational modeler. And he thinks most of what I just said is hopelessly vague and squishy. He calls all that stuff word models. It's very pejorative, mere word models. Like, you don't understand what's going on until you have the whole algorithm. My feeling is great, you get the whole algorithm, good for you. But before we have that, I think there's still some insights even from these low tech word models. Reasonable people can disagree on these things. Okay, um, behavioral data are good as I just showed you for dissociating mental phenomena. We started off by this course by saying, what are the different bits of, of mind and brain? And even by showing that face recognition seems to work with, with some different kinds of signatures from object recognition, that's already a clue, as Robert Yin inferred in 1969, that there may be separate bits of the brain for those two processes, okay? Um, okay, behavioral studies are cheap, and they're now really fast. You can put these things on Mechanical Turk, and you can get all your data for a whole experiment in an hour. It's amazing. Actually, I think that Mechanical Turk, you guys all know what Mechanical Turk is, right? Okay, it's this, it's like a job sourcing thing where you can just put on the web these tasks for people to do, and people all over the world go there and get paid not very much and do them. So instead of bringing subjects into the lab one at a time, sitting there for an hour as they press a button and do your experiment like I did when I was in graduate school, sitting there with the subject. You spend day after day after day to get 20 subjects. Um, now you put it up on the web and in an hour you have however many subjects you want. They do all those experiments. It has revolutionized um, experimental psychology. It's an, it's an amazing thing. One might argue that Mechanical Turk is more important for cognitive science than functional MRI. That would be an interesting debate to happen, to have. Okay, anyway, uh, behavioral studies are cheap and fast. They have weaknesses, however. Um, they don't tell us anything about the relationship to the brain. And for questions about the nature of the representation, that's not, doesn't mean that those inferences aren't right. It just seems like a damn shame not to link to the brain the physical implementation of the whole thing, okay? Um, but most importantly, as I mentioned before, it's amazing how far you can get with behavioral data because they are so sparse, right? All you have is the output of the system. So if you imagine this silly caricature of visual processing, you start with a retina, you have a whole bunch of stages of processing of information, who knows what they are, and then at some point a response gets blurted out verbally or a button gets pressed or some kind of action gives the subject's answer to the task, okay? And so that's all we have is the accuracy and reaction time of that. And from that, we're trying to infer all this complex stuff. And it's a whole lot more complex than that. There's feedback, there's interactions, there's other boxes, it's a whole big mess, right? Um, so um, that's what I mean by the data are sparse. You're just looking at the output. And essentially, 
it's kind of squashing all this stuff, right? We really want to know um, separately, we want to characterize what's going on at each of those stages. What are these representations like? What computations do you do to get from those to those? We want to know that whole thing, right? Um, we want to characterize all those separate bits, yeah? Okay, um, so to do that, it helps to look inside, right? 